In 1888, George Eastman revolutionizes the world of photography by introduction of his Kodak camera. A camera with such unusual name. George Eastman thought that a brand name should be short, incapable of being misspelled, and it should not mean anything. Original Kodak sold for $25. It came preloaded with enough film to take 100 round photographs. It featured barrel shutter and Bauschenam lens. You push the button, we do the rest was the advertising slogan that accompanied the Kodak. It was simple as that. Anybody could take a picture, simply push the button, advance to the next frame. When you're done with a roll of film, pack up the Kodak, send it to Rochester. The pictures are developed, printed, new roll of film is loaded and a whole Kodak is sent back to you. All for just $10. A new word is formed. Snapshot. Within months, Eastman changes the design from the barrel shutter to a sector shutter. And a year later, a bigger model, number two Kodak, is introduced. It's capable of producing three and a half inch round pictures on the roll of Kodak's stripping negative film or the new transparent film. The whole setup with the carrying case, preloaded film, cost $33. Now $33 is about $1,000 in today's money. I have it up on my Kodak simply by chance. Browsing eBay for brownies, came across this. And for very good price, I got me number two Kodak camera. So without further ado, let's take a closer look at this classic beauty. A camera that at this point is the oldest one that I own. Number two Kodak introduced in 1889 is a third generation Kodak camera after introduction of original Kodak in 1888. After introduction of his roll holder, Eastman thought that professionals would embrace the idea and would use it on all of their cameras. However, the roll holder was a success, but the film offered with it was not. Originally, Eastman offered what was called stripping negative, which was um, light sensitive material coated on paper. Now, to expose through paper base was uh, pretty difficult when it came to making prints. So, the results weren't as great. Eastman thought that if he had a product, a camera, that would be catered to amateur photographers, maybe they would not be as demanding as professional. This camera here is its third incarnation and takes larger pictures. Original Kodak took round pictures two and a half inches diameter, whereas this one takes uh, pictures that are three and a half inch diameter. And what's interesting about this camera, as you can see, there is no red window. This, there was no red window invented yet. That camera is a darkroom loaded camera and it, you have to unload it in darkroom as well. In 1889, Eastman offered this camera with his new transparent film, as well as the standard original stripping negative film. Now, the camera came preloaded with either 60 pictures or film for 60 pictures or 100 pictures. The price, as mentioned before, was $33. Now, what I like to do is give you a little bit of background on this camera and my own experience with it because I did shoot a couple rolls of film yes 120 film you can do it there's some modifications to the spools that you need to do not to the camera but to the spool so let me get into the details on how I did it this camera came to me from seller on eBay who apparently did not know much about it he could not open the camera he did not know how to do it 
So for a very good price, I got my paws on this beauty. Now, when I got it, I couldn't really figure out how to open it. I thought I, I, I did, but it proved a little bit difficult. Turned out that there was a screw inside the camera, and I'll show you that in a little bit, that got loose, uh, who knows when. And that screw uh, caused some binding and the whole bath would not come out. So after a little bit of persuasion, I made it out. And to my surprise, inside there was a picture. Uh, and that picture was embedded into the film magazine. It was, it was just sitting in there. My thinking is at some point it was a display camera. Somebody had it displayed in their house or in their collection. And uh, they had that little picture next to or inside the film holder. This is the photo. So what I did is I glued it onto a piece of um, cardboard. And you can see it's a round photograph. The reason behind that was so the photographer did not have to worry about the skewed horizon. And so they, they just decided to go with round. This is the last camera with the round, um, with the round pictures. Now, original Kodak took smaller ones than the second generation Kodak, which was still just like the original Kodak, uh, but with sector shutter instead of barrel shutter. And this is a larger version of it. They all took round photographs. Kodak th three, number three Kodak, number four Kodak took square, or, yeah, square photographs. Now, I was originally not going to be taking any pictures with it. The camera is fully functional and I'll be showing you that. However, being inspired by this particular photograph, I decided to see what sort of results we can get on the modern 120 film. So I ended up loading a roll of film and went out on my merry way and started taking pictures. And I came back and developed the first roll and the results were very, very soft. Um, they were, they were not usable. So I thought, hmm, uh, apparently the camera took good pictures back then. What happened? What, what changed? And it turned out that the whole front element, the inside there, is attached via screw from the bottom. And that screw got loose. That was causing the whole thing to bind up and not being able to remove the back. So I just tighten it, but I didn't tighten in the right position. This whole assembly moves back and forth. And despite the fact that this camera was supposed to be simple, there's no user um, input needed to make this camera work. Uh, they put that screw on the bottom that made the whole thing get out of alignment and not shoot sharp photos. But there was hope, there was a line of dust, so to speak, uh, inside the camera that showed the original position of this uh, whole assembly. So I loosened the screw and I brought the assembly back towards the film plane and that fixed the problem. Again, inspired by this photo. If it wasn't for this, I would have thought this camera took crappy photos. It, it does not, it takes very good photos for what it is. This line of Kodaks is now known as string set Kodak. So there's a string here, you pull it, that cocks the shutter, and then you press the button on the side to take a picture. Now let's um, go over some of the features that this camera offered that the original did not. So number two Kodak is, despite being a larger camera, it features sector shutter, and it features Bausch & Lomb lens. The lens, based on my calculation, is about uh, 60 millimeters, plus or minus a few millimeters. Uh, and if you, know, if you don't know how to measure that, there's a link to the video of mine, how to figure that, that out. Um, this is original design. If you see my video about uh, Kodak Bullseye, uh, that made the cameras much shorter because of the uh, film uh, spools were loaded in front of the 
film plane, whereas this codec here, its spools are behind the film plane. Uh, it does have a viewfinder, a round viewfinder where you can frame the photo. The original Kodak did not offer that. It had a criss uh, cross diagonal lines marked in its, um, in its frame on, on its leather. And that kind of gave a photographer an idea of what the line, or what the composition was. This camera does not have a counter, but it does have a little marker in there. And as you turn the, the, the winding key, the little notch on the top of the uh, idler spool turns and it gets uh, aligned with a marking on the back of this uh, bezel here. And that's number one frame and it works flawlessly. Uh, the three rolls I've shot, I did not have issues with uh, alignment. I did not, the only issue I had is to find the number one and after that, it'll align perfectly every single time. Imagine this was loaded with um, 100 pictures. So I had issues keeping track of the seven pictures that I would fit on a 120 uh, roll of film. There was a booklet that would come with this camera and photographer would be able to track the amount of pictures um, they took. They would write a little note as, uh, as to what exposure was, how the distance was, um, all this good stuff. Speaking of um, distance, the lens is pre-focused at certain spot. It's hyperfocal distance so that it's sharp from about 10 feet all the way to infinity, which is really cool. You don't have to worry about uh, focusing with these models. Kodak number, number three Kodak, number four Kodak used larger film, therefore they had to be focused and that already caused some issues because um, amateur photographers did not want to deal with that. They just want to take pictures. Interestingly, uh, this camera was produced all the way until 1897 and still for the same price, $33. At that point, there were much cheaper alternatives such as bullseye, whether it be Boston bullseye or Kodak bullseye camera that cost uh, $8 compared to crazy amount like that. Let's see how to set the shutter on this camera and how to take a picture. It's very simple. I opened the, the front uh, cover just for that. You simply pull the little string that sets the shutter for you and on the side of the camera there's a button, you press that and that's all there's to it. Picture is taken. And then you wind to the next exposure. Now let's um, take a look how to remove the back uh, of this camera and how to load film. I'm not going to load film, but I'll just show you the, uh, the intricacies of that particular magazine. What's interesting is that this camera was not supposed to have been loaded by the end user. It was preloaded at the factory, it's sent to you, and then you take pictures and then you pack it up and you send it back to them. And at uh, Eastman, they would uh, unload the film in a dark room, and I'll show you why that is. And they would develop your pictures, reload the film, and send it back to you. Very interesting. Um, so this is not something that end user would be doing. So in order to open it, you have to do a couple steps. Step number one, you have to remove the winding key. So you simply turn it clockwise and it unscrews it. It's a left-handed thread. Don't lose the key. And on the bottom of the camera, you have the little sort of a latch here. You press that in. I use the key because my fingers are not um, small enough to fit in that little hole. And that pops the hole back out. And hey presto, you have your film magazine which is sitting upside down. This is the mask that made the pictures round. There's a cardboard sort of a mask and there's this um, wood, wooden bezel 
whatever you want to call it, sort of a, um, a piece that holds this whole assembly together. So you remove that and the cardboard mask slides off. And here are the rollers. Now, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of space in there. Imagine a, a roll of um, a roll of film enough to take 100 pictures must have been rather substantial in, in bulk. So I guess that's why there's so much space there. And this is the, the take up uh, spool. And over here you have that little indicator that I was talking about. You can see a little notch in there. As I turn this idler roller. And that notch corresponds with a little notch on the bezel on top of the camera. You'll notice that the, the idler spool has two little tacks protruding here and that was to catch onto the film and help it spin as it um, as it was uh, making its way around the, the magazine. So how does one take pictures with this camera using 120 film? Uh, it's quite simple actually. Here I have a spool and I bought the ends these are adapters for 122 film that I bought on eBay because I thought I was going to be shooting some 122 film and that never happened so I got these and the one of the the spool ends had to be modified to fit uh, where this wooden spool sits so in order to use it, there's this uh, pin here on top. And the pin is marked with number two, and there's a number two stamped onto the wood uh, wooden base. And same thing goes for the take-up spool. This is marked with number one, this is marked with number two. So you align these numbers and you pull the pin out. Hopefully you don't lose the roller now at this point, the roller is it's not needed. You can um, you can go ahead and put it on the side because you won't be using it to shoot 120 film. Now, as you can see, there's this um, sort of a mechanism here. There's a spring, and there's this um, uh, contraption on the bottom. Uh, what happens is one side of the spool has to sit in there. That's why I had to notch it like this, a weird way. And it's a 3D printer one, so it came out weird looking, but it does fit on the bottom here. So what you would do is um, take your fresh spool, put the bottom on, put the top on, you would stick it in there, take your pin and hey presto you have a fresh roll of film loaded in there now you would take the film spool it behind the, the idler around these idlers here across the face all the way here underneath this little brass uh, clamp and you would clamp it down and you would advance the film a few times and the way I did it is until the start mark came out around here I had to guess so each time was different but the third time that I shot uh, I got I got the best uh, results in terms of spacing and in terms of um, uh, finding the, the starting position so start mark around this uh, area. Now when you are done what happened is the, um, the paper got pulled out and you can actually feel there was no tension anymore so you would bring it back and I would stick the whole assembly into the whole camera and everything into my dark bag and I would uh, then uh, proceed to take the spool out. So the film was spooled 120 film about 
here, but then half inch from the bottom, half inch from the top. And I'll take it out and put it in my developing tank straight out. And then reassemble the camera back the way it was. As I was um, removing the mask here, you might have probably noticed that there's, um, there's an address and a name of the person, L. Shoy, L. R. Shoy, Shoy's. And he lived at 50 to 20 on Clap Road in Racine, Wisconsin. Now I looked that address up, but I did not go any further in terms of trying to contact whoever lived there. Maybe he doesn't live there. Maybe he died. It says property of so and so. But this camera did not come from Wisconsin. It came from, I believe it was Texas. And how it made its way there, no idea. Might have been through a garage sale or an estate sale. Somebody bought it. But I'm really happy I got this. It's fully operational. It's fully working. No, no doubt about it. I'm guessing this is the part where I would um, put this camera back together and maybe um, give some closure to the video. And I will be sharing some pictures at the end and you will be able to see these results again. They're not round pictures because of the width of my film, but they are um, oval. So nevertheless, still cool looking. Well, let's put it back together. You take the back, you make sure it's uh, right side up. Put the mask back on, put this uh, wooden sort of a bezel. Just like so. Then you take the back of the camera or the body of it and then you just slide the whole magazine in. And that's it. In closure, this camera is your camera's grand, great granddad. It is Nikon's great granddad. It is a Canon's and Sony's and Leica's and Rollies and Yashica's and anybody else's that came after that. It is Eastman's brilliance and Eastman's initiative and his push to put photography in everybody's hand that made this camera possible. It is his failures with a roll holder not being able to uh, get embraced by professional photographers that made this camera possible. So for the last time, let's set the shutter, let's trigger it, and let's hear this wonderful sound of this 1889 number two Kodak camera. <laughs>